Akiva, are you ready? Yes. All right. You want to turn your camera back on? There we are. Perfect. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our research seminar. My name is Cinnamon Moffitt, and I'm the research program manager at OSU's Hatfield Marine Science Center in Newport, Oregon. Um, and I will be your host today. Just a couple logistics before we get started. We are on a Zoom meeting, but we have disabled your cameras, mics, and screen share. If you could help us by keeping it that way for this uh, meeting, that would be great. We would love for you to uh, chat with us, uh, ask any questions, just use the chat box on the bottom. There's a little pop-up box there and if you type on or push on it, you can type your questions at any time um, and we will answer them together um, at the end of today's uh, presentation. Um, wanted to let you know that today's presentation and all of our seminars are actually recorded. And so if somebody wasn't able to join us today, um, I am putting into the chat box as a practice so you can find the chat as well, um, where you can find uh, this seminar, which will be posted on the page that is in the chat box, um, probably by Monday. Uh, a quick announcement uh, for next week. I just want to let you know that uh, for next week's seminar, we have Bailey Lovett from the University of Auckland. One of the wonderful things about doing Zoom meetings for seminar. Um, and she's gonna be joining us to talk about the development of spinal curvatures of farm New Zealand Chinook salmon. So that'll be an interesting um, talk. And if you would like to find out the links and the information to um, join us for that, you can go to the HMSC's main webpage, scroll to the bottom and there's a calendar there, which will have the link for that event. But for today, um, today's speaker is Kiva Oken, and she is an assistant professor at the Department of Wildlife, Fish, and Conservation Biology at UC Davis. She earned her PhD in Quantitative Ecology Resource Management at the University of Washington. Um, she then did postdocs at Rutgers and the University of Washington before she worked for the Northwest Fisheries Science Center in Seattle using mathematical models to study, study ecology, conservation, and management of marine fisheries. She was invited to speak to us today by Hatfield's Will White. And Kiva, it is yours. Take it away. Thank you. Um, and thanks, uh, Cinnamon and Will, for inviting me. Um, um, so let me just fix this. Sorry. Um, yeah, so um, I'm excited to talk to you all today. I think sort of one of the, um, as Simon said, one of the silver linings of COVID is sort of whether you're five miles away or 500 miles away, it makes no difference. Um, and I also wanted to start um, with this slide. So I feel like this is also coming full circle. I was actually an REU student at Oregon State with Lorenzo Cinelli many years ago. Um, and so I feel like giving a seminar as part of this series is really coming full circle, which Will might not have realized when he invited me. Um, now I'll sort of get started. Um, and as we sort of all know, populations uh, in marine and then populations in general don't exist in a vacuum. Um, and so fisheries ecology sort of studies how these populations interact with each other and with their environment. Um, and so species interactions can connect the dynamics of one population to those of another. So for example, we have um, predation and predator-prey interactions um, can mean that uh, a higher, um, a larger population of prey might be good for productivity of predators and a larger population of predators might be bad for the productivity of the prey. Um, but there are other kinds of species interactions as well, um, mutualisms um, like with habitat for big organisms and that sort of thing. And um, the other sort of idea to keep in mind is that all of these populations are experiencing the same shared physical environment. Uh, so that includes temperature and salinity and oxygen and, and sort of the changes in the currents from year to year. Um, and and so I think, so these direct interactions between populations and this shared um, physical environment that they're experiencing and possibly um, displaying similar or opposite um, responses to this shared environment means that the dynamics of populations are fundamentally linked. Um, that's sort of the, the biophysical side of, of fisheries ecology, but 
Um, you can also think about the human dimensions side of fisheries as well. And so if we think about um, a single species approach, sort of the effect of humans on fish populations is just to subtract out um, whatever biomass we catch from the population each year. Um, but fisheries themselves can also induce connections among populations. So uh, I have two examples here. Um, so uh, people generally participate in more than one fishery throughout the year. So on the West Coast, um, the most common um, fishing participation combination is Dungeness crab and salmon trolling. And so if something changes in the crab fishery, say there is um, uh, either biophysically or in terms of management, which is happening right now, that might induce changes in effort to the salmon fishery, which um, can affect both how much um, money people earn from the salmon fishery, but can also affect um, the salmon population dynamics themselves. And uh, the other example over here um, on the right um, is bycatch. So for example, this is a tow from the, or um, of, from the Oregon pink shrimp fishery. Um, and you can see all these little silver eulicon um, um, in that, that are getting caught in that tow. And so eulicon are actually ESA listed, as threatened. Um, and so if you catch too many eulicon, that can shut down the, the pink shrimp fishery, even if the fishery is doing well, which could affect the shrimp population dynamics. And, and the same can be true if there's a really big shrimp here, you might catch more eulicon as by catch. So the big take home here is that human activities also induce connections among populations. And those connections manifest themselves in both the, the benefits that people um, get from the fishery and in the population dynamics themselves. Um, and so there's, um, so ecosystem-based fisheries management is this sort of very popular term. Uh, it's almost 20 years old at this point, and it's um, about managing at a scale above the individual population. But I think traditionally that idea has been more in terms of biophysical um, connections among populations. Uh, but now we're beginning to recognize that it's important um, to recognize sort of connections across the whole triple bottom line. So that being ecological sustainability, um, social sustainability, and economically sustainable fisheries. And so it's important to recognize connections among parts of the system across all three um, of these parts, of these facets of sustainability um, in order to ensure that the whole system is sustainable and there's sort of feedbacks among these um, connections. So ecosystem-based fisheries management is hard. I think we are making progress, um, but there's still work to be done. And I think one of the common things people say when um, common excuses people give is that these marine food webs are just too complex. So this is, this is um, a, a network diagram of the food web of the California current. Um, and so there, there's just, there's a lot of predators, there's a lot of prey. It's really unclear what the effect of a change in one population would do to a second population because there's so many different connections happening. So people just throw up their hands and say, I can't do it, it's too hard. Um, on top of that biophysical complexity, we also have fishing, um, people also are participating in multiple fisheries. And so there's a whole level of complexity from those fishing participation networks as well. So this now, instead of looking at a food web, um, and trophic connections among populations, we're looking at, um, this is a participation network of the West Coast. So we can see that um, this is the, the size of the dots is revenue. So Dungeness crab is the largest fishery on the West Coast in terms of revenue. And a lot of people who participate in the crab fishery participate in other fisheries. Um, so we have these sort of complexities in both the trophic dynamics and in the fishing human dynamics participation sort of thing. And so people say, oh, there's complex food webs, there's these complex um, fishing dynamics, so we can't possibly manage for all of this complexity, so they just throw up their hands. But I think that's really a lost opportunity, and there's a lot of ways that we can interrogate these systems into more digestible chunks. Uh, but the challenge is that um, the solutions tend, can't really be cookie cutter. They, have to, they tend to be more place-based. Um, you have to go system by system to find the so for the rest of the talk today, I'm going to give a few different examples of paths 
that we could take that might help us move down the road towards operationalizing ecosystem-based fisheries management. Um, so the first example is uh, a little bit more ecological and it's sort of like a triage um, for determining when predation might be important. So we have these really complex webs so it might be useful um, to sort of pick out situations where predation is an important process um, in population dynamics and other situations where we might focus on other processes. Um, and then the second two examples are, are both focused on the California current actually. Um, and the, the first example is looks at sort of the interplay um, between predator prey interactions and bycatch. Um, and then the second example looks at rather than thinking, we often think about um, multi-species management from like a total allowable catch perspective, um, but, in, but instead looking at access, um, uh, fishery access rights from a multi-species perspective um, instead. And so sort of there's, there's a need to sort of look at all facets of fisheries from um, a more holistic perspective. So we'll get started. Um, I think this question of when does predator abundance influence prey dynamics is one of the oldest questions in ecology in general. Um, is doesn't only relate to fisheries. And um, there are a lot of hypotheses. And so one hypothesis is, is that predator diversity might be important. So um, these, I, um, I'm going to try to explain these lines as best I can. So we have, if we imagine um, a predator population, um, in the, the, that's sort of the top line. And then the bottom line, if I'm a prey, is sort of the angry mouth index. It's how many angry predators are out there to eat me. Um, so when there's only one predator, then this total predation index is, is going to look, is just going to perfectly mimic that predator population. And with a single predator, when if there's a large fluctuation in that predator population, we might expect to see a negative relationship between the predator and the prey abundance, suggesting top-down control. Now, if we add a second predator population, um, let's say we keep sort of total consumption of me, the prey, constant, um, then we see that the total predation here on the bottom has become a little bit less variable. It sort, um, it sort of averages the two populations. And as we continue adding predator population, that total predation index gets less and less variable. So that now when we have four populations, um, a single predator and prey probably won't be correlated because there's too many other things happening at the same time. And you might not even see a signal um, it, with the aggregate total predation and the prey because we see that total predation is just very constant through time and it's not changing much. Um, and so other processes are more likely to lead to changes in predator productivity. So this is sort of the first hypothesis. If you add more predators to the system, you're less likely to observe an effect of predation on prey. Um, now the second hypothesis relates to synchrony. So um, these four orange populations are all um, oscillating independently of one another. They're each doing their own thing. But as I mentioned, all of these populations exist in a shared physical environment. So if we imagine that all of the populations are sort of synchronous with one another and responding similarly to that environment, we see that total predation now, um, now in, in teal is um, a little bit more variable because we're sort of closer to just a single population. So if predators are tightly synchronized, we're more likely to observe variation in prey abundance due to predators because there's more of variation in sort of um, the angry mouse index. On the other hand, if um, the predator populations are asynchronous, so maybe one is cold water loving and one is warm water loving, um, then uh, we see that the total predation index is flattest and um, we're least likely to see predators control the abundance. So we put these two ideas together into a single schematic. We can imagine two axes of predator control. There's sort of the diversity axis and the synchrony axis. And so we would see the lowest potential for predator control in this bottom right corner and the highest potential in this top left. And so the question, so I basically wanted to see where do marine ecosystems, different marine ecosystems around the world um, lie on this schematic. Then the two questions I have to answer are how diverse are marine predator assemblages? And do predator populations within assemblages vary uh, synchronously, asynchronously, or independently? 
And to answer those questions, I combine information from two different sources. So first, I have surveys um, and stock assessments that can give information on how abundance changes through time. And then the second, I have these snapshot web models that can give information on predator consumption. So I collected those two pieces of information um, for 10 ecosystems across um, North America and Europe. Um, and then I specifically picked out 36 different prey species um, across those 10 different ecosystems. Um, and so I'll be looking at the predator assemblage that consumes um, each prey group differently. So, um, uh, so, so different prey groups uh, within the same ecosystem might experience a different predator effect. Um, so I need to sort of calculate this, the sum predation index or like the strength of this predator assemblage. Um, and so to do that, I took a weighted sum of predator abundances. So rather than just summing up the abundances of all the predators that eat the prey, um, I took this weighted sum where the weights depend on how much a predator consumes. So if a predator consumes more like say a, a marine mammal, um, they will get up weighted. And also the predator's diet. So if I represent a really important component of the predator's diet, that predator will also get up weight. And so these weightings are sort of based on average or reference condition. So they're not going to change through time. Um, so, I, so once again, I sort of calculated, I have this abundance and feeding habit information for 36 different predator assemblages across 10 different ecosystems. That's a lot to manage. So today's sort of uh, mascot is going to be a uh, capelin in the Eastern Bering. And that's, that'll sort of be the example um, that I give. So um, the first thing I did was create um, predation indexes using just a baseline abundance. So this predation index doesn't change through time. It's just sort of a snapshot. And this is to give a sense of diversity of assemblage. So uh, for Cape Lynn in the Eastern Bering Sea, the most dominant predator is squid, followed by fur seals, wintering seals, uh, and a bunch of other species and groups. Um, and these are the top 10. Um, I was really particularly interested, um, not necessarily in the height of this bar, but in the composition of this bar. And so squids here, right, are the, the most dominant predator. And squids happen to make up about 20% of the total height of this bar, of the total predation index. So if we take that, sort of the dominance of the most dominant predator, we can do that across all 36 predator assemblages for the 36 different prey groups. And, and then I sort of, then I created a histogram. So now we're gonna see a histogram of the dominance of the dominant predator group. Um, and this is what we saw. And I was actually kind of surprised. So I expected um, marine ecosystems are really big and complex and diverse. So the, um, the dominant predator should not be very dominant. And I expected to see, um, to see see most of the cases lying over here um, to, to the left side. Um, and so I was quite surprised sort of how diverse the diversity was. So what, what a wide range we see. So there are some cases um, where the predator assemblage is really do highly dominated by a single group um, or species. Um, the other thing that is interesting here is it was actually important to account for feeding habits. So now here in light blue, you're seeing an unweighted index where we're just summing up the abundance of anything that eats the prey. Um, you're either in or out. Um, and in that case, we do sort of see that left skewed distribution that I expected um, that's not heavily dominated by any predator. So it was so accounting for heat feeding habits was important to get this result that there's actually a wide variety of dominance of predators um, in these marine predator assemblages. Of course, uh, we know abundance varies through time. Um, so this was sort of what I just showed you now, but in reality, the abundance is changing through time. Um, ab ab the abundance of all these different predators that compose the index is changing through time, um, kind of like this. So if we actually take the data for how the predators change through time, this is what we see for Capelin in the Eastern Bering Sea. So this is sort of now the time varying index. And this is what I use to answer the question about predator synchrony. 
Um, so now you're going to see different synchrony values show up in this figure. And so if it lies on the horizontal line, that means the predators in the assemblage vary independently of one another. Above the horizontal line is synchrony and below the bottom line is asynchrony. Uh, so this is where, uh, so capelin in the eastern, the predators that consume capelin in the eastern Bering Sea um, are slightly asynchronous. Um, and now this is what you see for all of the 36 predator assemblages I, um, I looked at. Uh, it's important to sort of get a sense of uncertainty. So how far do you have to be in the horizontal line before you're actually not independent? So I built these null distributions. Um, and the way to, to read these is if a point lies in the tail of these distributions, um, that's evidence that those predators are varying synchronously or asynchronously um, of one another. Uh, but I think the real take home message here is that most of these points are lying in sort of the main mass of the distribution and not really much evidence that the predators are, are sort of um, moving in concert with one another. Uh, and the, the colors here are different ecosystems. So I think the exceptions were by ecosystem in the east. This is the Eastern Bering Sea. So those predators tend to be a bit asynchronous. Um, here is the North Sea in gray. So those were a bit synchronous. Um, I think that's mostly a shared fishing history in that case. Uh, but the, the real story here is that there, there wasn't a whole lot of synchrony or asynchrony in these predator assemblages. So let's go back. Um, to that schematic of predator control. Um, and where, where do we see marinus predator assemblages? And I think the answer is, is this oval. So we see a lot of variability across the diversity axis and less variability across the synchrony axis. So I think if you're trying to decide whether to think about predation um, in the context of a prey population, um, it's more useful to look at the diversity of the predator assemblage than the synchrony. Uh, a few other take home messages um, is first that this was sort of surprising that diverse systems still have the potential to experience predator control because the predator assemblage that consumes a given prey species might not be diverse, even if the system itself is very diverse and well connected um, like that. Second, um, sort of related to the first item is that it's really important to consider predator assemblages from the perspective of the prey. So if we had just summed up all of the isovores in the system, we would have gotten a different answer um, than if we had actually built, custom built each predator assemblage for each, thinking about what is consuming each different prey population. And then third, especially since this isn't something you'll see in the other two pieces, um, I think comparisons across ecosystems are really valuable tools to understand um, a lot of processes that are happening. So we obviously can't conduct predatory exclusion experiments in these massive shelf, you know, continental shelf systems. Um, and so we have to get creative about how we're going to do experiments. And I think one way to do that is to look across systems. Um, and you can do this not just with sort of by ecological processes like predation, but you can also do this with um, different management um, regimes. Okay. Um, so now these, the, now we're sort of going to move to the California current um, for the rest of the talk. Uh, and this is a, once again about predation. And, and one sort of, I think, important um, facet of predation in marine systems that is relevant to this piece is that fish predation is, are, is size structured and fish are gate limited predators. And what this means is that medium fish eat little fish and big fish eat all different sizes of fish. So that within a po single population, there are individuals occupying many different trophic levels. Um, so that's sort of like the basic theory that's sort of important to keep in the back of your mind. Um, so in the California current, um, several species of rockfish are recovering from overfishing. So there was a massive collapse of the groundfish fishery around 2000. Um, and a few of the longest li lived um, species in that assemblage um, are still um, under rebuilding plan. So this is a uh, yellow eye rockfish, for example, um, that's still below the management target. As a response to the collapse in 2000, um, the government set up US rockfish conservation areas. These have changed slightly since their initial inception, but the idea is to keep bottom contact fishing gear off of sensitive rockfish habitat to sort of aid in their recovery. 
Um, that habitat that got protected, though, protects a whole community um, of fish that um, and non-fish um, that live there. And so lean cod are another um, species that occupy a similar habitat, um, but they're a much more productive species um, uh, and um, have much shorter generation time. And so they were rebuilt quite some time ago and are now um, really healthy. So they also collapsed, but uh, recovered more. Lean cod are top predators in this system as well, so they really like to chow down on juvenile rockfish. Um, this uh, yellow eye rockfish was found in the stomach of this lean cod, and this octopus was actually found in the stomach of the yellow eye. That, that's actually a really big yellow eye, but mostly they tend to eat smaller eye than that. Um, so lean cod are predators, they eat juvenile rockfish, and so there's some concern that they could be limiting the recovery um, of some of these rockfish species that they're consuming. People also like to eat ling cod. Um, it's a pretty tasty white fish, but it's actually really hard to find um, ling cod from the West Coast in the grocery store. Um, it's usually from Alaska. Because, uh, and um, they're, they're heavy, ling cod is generally heavily underutilized. So we're um, catching like 25% of the sustainable quota of ling cod. Whereas if we were catching 100% of that quota, it would still be sustainable. Um, and the problem is that people can't catch ling cod without catching these <clears throat> overfished rockfish. Um, and so they're kind of stuck. So we got together with some fishing groups um, and the Nature Conservancy <clears throat> to look at this issue. Because what's going on here? <clears throat> Sorry. Um, so we have this age structured rockfish population where the little rockfish are getting consumed by. Uh, ling cod. And we're interested in, in a fishery that's going to mostly catch ling cod, but there will also be some bycatch of older rock. The question is, can these, this adult, um, increased adult mortality be offset by decreased juvenile mortality from these cold ling cod populations, basically? Um, and so more specifically, the questions that I wanted to look at with this study or what aspects of the ecology and the fishery are most influential in determining the fishery's ultimate impact to rock? And so to answer that question, I built a simple um, equilibrium-based model. And so this allowed me to easily understand the dynamics of the model and to iterate through many different parameterizations. This is sort of a first step um, in the process. Uh, the structure of the model um, is that, so there's an age-structured ling cod population, so the ling cod grow um, and then they reproduce. There's a stock relationship and then they're also uh, caught by the fishery. Um, the, the, the bigger ling cod are caught by the fishery. There's also a rockfish um, population um, and the rockfish are consumed by ling cod and that's a size structured relationship and the rockfish also have a stock recruit relationship as well and the rockfish are caught by the fishery but at a lower rate than the ling cod but proportional to the effort. Um, uh, so I looked at the sensitivity of the model to pretty much all of these parameters, um, all of these different processes. And today I'll focus on um, the two in red. I forgot to also put in red that arrow. And I'm gonna show this here a bunch of times, so I'll walk you through it slowly. On the x-axis is the fishing mortality rate. This is how hard you're fishing. And on the y-axis is the gear selectivity. So this is how effective the gear is at discriminating between rockfish and ling cod. The first thing we might look at is the curve. This is an equilibrium model. So this is the curve where in the long run, the rockfish population will end up where it would if there were no fishing at all. Um, so we see we can either um, not fish and have fish very little and have gear that's more indiscriminate um, or fish harder and have gear that's better avoiding rockfish. Um, above this curve um, means if you're fishing in a condition that's above this curve, that means in the long run, rockfish populations will equilibrate below their unfished biomass. Um, and below the curve, this is sort of not intuitive, you'll end up with more rockfish than you would if there were no fishing at all because you're not catching very many rockfish and you're removing a ton of predators from the water. So you end up with more rockfish in the water. And then we can look at how quickly the population moves away from this equilibrium condition. So bluer colors mean more rockfish, 
redder colors mean less rockfish. So this is what happens when we put these colors onto the figure. And then the last thing that might be of interest, the, the management target is not unfished biomass. We're trying to um, rebuild rockfish to 40% of their unfished biomass. Um, and so that is this line in gray is 40% of the So uh, the first thing we might look at is the stock recruit relationship between rockfish is how many, um, yeah, the stock recruit relationship, sort of how many young they're producing. And, and what happens is as you increase density dependence in rockfish, that increases the resilience of the population. Um, so what is happening here is that as, um, when you have high density dependence within the rockfish population, that means that you're gonna see um, sort of the same number of rockfish produced at a wide range of spawning biomasses. Um, it's sort of less dependent on spawning biomass. Uh, so when that happens, that means even when there's a low spawning biomass, you're still gonna get a lot of young rockfish each year. Um, so then there's more resilience in the system and you move away from this unfished condition very slowly um, in, in terms of sort of how hard you're fishing. But um, when there's low density dependence, that means if you were, that means if the rockfish population declines um, a little bit, you will also see a little bit less um, recruitment into the population. Um, and so, because it's so responsive to changes in adult biomass, you see much more rapid changes um, in the equilibrium rockfish abundance. And and um, the unfished biomass curve stays in the same place, but um, regardless of what happens. But this 40% line, which is the management target, does move. Um, and so this for, there's a lot more conditions um, that are better than, that lead, to a con, that lead to something better than the management target when there's high density dependence. And when there's low density dependence, there's sort of fewer conditions under this curve that lead to um, a positive outcome. Um, next, we'll look at selectivity. Um, of the rockfish. So this is what size of rockfish um, you're catching. Sorry, computer troubles. Ah, there we go. Um, so here we see that if we, um, if we're catching um, a wide range, so here we're catching on the left, we're catching a wide range of sizes of rockfish, and here we're only catching the largest rockfish. Um, in general, these two figures don't really look that different. It's, it's better to catch bigger rockfish. Um, you see more blue, but it's not very different. Um, and I'm going to contrast that with the diet of the link cod. So here, um, if we contrast where the uh, link cod, when link cod eat less rockfish, we see almost no blue. And so what happens is you're catching a bunch of rockfish as bycatch in this fishery, and there's very little benefit to the rockfish, to the juvenile survival, because they're, the lean cod aren't eating very many rockfish. Um, so there's not much benefit, and you're catching the rockfish, so it's very red. When the lean cod eat more rockfish, um, there's a lot more to gain from removing lean cod from the system, so there's a lot more blue. But I think the real key is that you're seeing these huge qualitative differences uh, between pretty small differences in the lean cod diet. I think this is mildly overstated because of how it's parameterized, but um, this is an important understanding how much and what sizes of, link, of rockfish link cut are eating is important. And then this is sort of looking to the future. Um, so that was, I think, so that's sort of what I've looked at so far, but I think that this was all an equilibrium based model. Um, and so thinking about a next step for this project, um, is there's been cool research that shows that um, when you have an ecosystem that you need to recover, so lingcod and rockfish were both overfished in 2000, um, if you recover a predator first, which is what happened in this system, that leads to the slowest community, that leads to the slowest community return time. Um, whereas if you were to recover rockfish and lingcod synchronously, um, that would have been the fastest. So I think there's just, there's a lot of questions you can ask um, with more dynamic models. Um, about this system, about sort of how fast things are recovering. Because this is just what's happening in the long run. But I think what we're often most interested in as applied ecologists is, is what happens in the interim. A few other um, 
thoughts on this um, is that quantitative diet um, and also habitat unit use information is important. So um, lean cod are generalists. They kind of will eat whatever they can get their mouths around. Uh, so not only understanding what they like to eat, but also understanding what um, is co what what they have available to them, what's on the table for them to eat um, is important. Because what's on the table is, is really what they are eating. They're not super selective. Um, second, I think this is a cool um, example where ecosystem-based fisheries management leads to kind of a win-win. So we're thinking at this, um, it's not really, we often think about it as trade-offs. So, um, you know, we need to save some prey biomass so that the seabirds have more to eat. Um, and that's one component of ecosystem-based fisheries management. But what it's really about is this more holistic perspective and thinking about connections across components of this larger system. And in this case, it sort of leads to a win-win where um, we can fish more, we can catch more lingcod and the rockfish can still continue their recovery. Um, and then third, I think this is a cool example where models can hopefully be used to simulate new questions um, in empirical research. So there's been um, more research recently looking at um, diet and consumption patterns of lean cod um, to sort of better, and they are sort of better quantifying what lean cod in the California are consuming. And so I think there's sort of this iteration. And so I think the next step now is to take some of that better information we have, and now we can ask more detailed questions um, that sort of go beyond these equilibrium models. All right. And then this final piece um, looks, uh, we're going to look a little bit more at the human dynamics um, and sort of the economics of a fishery from a, from a multi-species perspective, thinking about access rights. So any financial investor knows that um, investing in a diverse portfolio of assets can stabilize your returns from year to year. We sort of call this the portfolio effect. And it turns out that fishermen also invest in a diverse portfolio of assets. Um, but in their case, assets are permits to participate in different fisheries. And those different fisheries um, vary from year to year. Uh, I've sort of explained the, um, the portfolio effect to you already when we talked about those different predator populations. So now, instead of thinking of these as um, predator populations, my cursor. Um, instead of thinking about these as different predator populations, uh, we can think about them as different fisheries. And then instead of thinking about total predation, we can think about it as total revenue that someone is earning from participating in those four different fisheries. And um, this also goes for um, synchrony. So um, in this sort of, so I'm going to talk about both the diversity of people's fishing portfolios and also the synchrony of the populations in those fishing portfolios. That same idea where more synchronous populations lead to more variable revenue sort of holds here as well. Um, it, in, there is evidence that um, diverse fishing portfolios can improve revenue stability. So what we see here is as species diversity of um, someone's permit portfolio increases, um, the revenue variability of that per, um, permit portfolio for the average person who holds that portfolio goes down. But unfortunately, fishing portfolios are getting um, less and less diverse through time. So here we can see um, average revenue diversity by vessel. Um, and it's been going down since um, the 1980s. And it's actually been going down um, even more strongly for people who have started fishing more recently. So that's um, in, in the gray solid line, um, is below the sort of the old timers that have been fishing since the 80s. And a lot of this decline um, is due to new programs, um, limited entry programs and cat shares, individual transferable quotas. And there are a lot of benefits to these programs. Um, they can, um, from, there are a lot of benefits, both ecological and economic to these, to these programs. But one downside of the programs is that it makes diversifying your fishing portfolio often prohibitively expensive. 
So I have, um, so we have these different ideas here that we're trying to integrate. There's this idea of portfolio effects. Um, there's an idea, this idea of synchrony, um, and and then um, also this idea of access rights. And I'm trying uh, integrating all three of those into an empirical framework can be hard. Um, and so instead today, I'm going to use a simulation model um, that will allow us to sort of better understand the mechanisms of what's going on. Um, uh, to sort of I'd hopefully sort of inspire new empirical research that might be a little more detailed and um, look at different mechanisms. Uh, because we, th in doing, by doing this, we can test different scenarios that we might not be able to observe. Um, so uh, the big question is how do fishery access and population synchrony influence patterns of revenue? Um, and so to do this, I built another sort of similar, more stylized model, except this model is going to be uh, much more, the previous model with the lingcod and rockfish was fairly detailed on sort of the ecology and the predator-prey relationship. This model is going to have um, a lot more detail in the fishing dynamics and a little less um, ecological detail. Uh, and that's because of the questions that we're asking are sort of about um, the, the benefits that people are getting from these different portfolios. So the stylized model is based on Dungeness crab, Chinook salmon, and sort of a generic ground fish um, in the California current. So I'll just, uh, just describe each of those populations a little bit, um, species a little briefly, fisheries, I guess. Um, so the Dungeness crab fishery um, experiences enormous depletion from the beginning to the end of the season. We basically assume all legal size males are caught by the end of the year. Um, it, the permits are extremely expensive. It's a fairly lucrative fishery, as um, you saw at the beginning of the talk. It's the largest grossing fishery um, on the West Coast. Uh, people have looked, and there's very limited relationship between spawning biomass and recruitment each year, so it tends to be much more strongly driven by physical oceanographic factors. Um, this is changing, as some people might be aware of, but traditionally um, the fishery has opened sort of at the beginning of December. Uh, and is, is more of a winter fishery. So most of the bio, it closes in the summer. Well, it, that's also changing. Traditionally, it's closed in the summer, um, but most of the biomass is caught in the first couple. Uh, for salmon, we see a lot less depletion of the population from the beginning to end of the season. The permits are relatively affordable. Uh, stock recruit relationship for salmon is kind of complicated, but the fishery is mainly driven by hatchery populations. Um, and so those are sort of just pushed out um, into the ocean each year. Uh, and so what really de determines the abundance of adults is the number of, um, is sort of their survival during the freshwater and marine um, phases. Um, and the fishery is sort of a summertime fishery mostly. Uh, for both of these populations, because um, uh, the animals that are available from one year to the next are kind of, um, there are unique individuals each year. Um, there's no population dynamics, so the population doesn't carry over from one year to the next. Um, it's just random recruitment each year with a little bit of autocorrelation to simulate an autocorrelated environment. And then the, um, the final population uh, species complex, I guess, is ground fish. And they have the least depletion from the beginning to end of year. So groundfish populations are really long lived. Um, I would say 20 is sort of short for um, these species. Uh, they are, the permits are of middling price uh, when you compare them to crab and salmon. They do tend to display at least a weak stock recruit relationship. Um, and the fishery operates year round. And because the available biomass, a lot of the same fish are available to the fishery from one year to the next. We're not catching all of the available biomass each year. Um, there's a lot of sort of survival and growth that carries over from one year to the next. Um, they needed sort of a more explicit population model. Um, and so for that, I used a delayed difference model, um, sort of like a cheater age structure model. Um, and, and they do have a stock recruit relationship. So the spawning biomass does have some influence on with a little bit of randomness to each year. That's sort of the three different fisheries. Um, and then each week, each vessel makes a decision to fish, and they make that decision um, based on how much fish they think they would catch. We assume they know that perfectly. Um, so that's the abundance. Um, they make the decision based on how much money they'll earn. So that's based on the prices they would get and also the cost 
it, it the, the cost of fishing that week. And then also based on whether it's legal to fish for that population in that week. <clears throat> so, there, so each vessel makes this decision each week. And then I simulated that, um, that decision-making process for 52 weeks a year. And then each year, there's a new recruitment that I simulate um, for each of the three populations. Um, and that sort of goes into what the available biomass is. Um, and then a single simulation goes through this process for 50 years. Uh, and in each simulation, I randomize the cost to fish for each vessel for each population. So there is an average of the cost to fish, but we assume there's some heterogeneity, a little bit of difference among the vessels. Some are more efficient than others. And that's just random. And then I did 10,000 simulations for each parameter set. And the parameter sets are really what's getting at our scientific questions, looking at um, the synchrony and the ease of access to getting a permit. Um, so we sort of, those are our different, the parameter sets are our different experiments. And we have 10,000 experimental replicates. Because uh, computers can do that. So the first question I'll look at is how does recruitment synchrony influence revenue patterns? Um, uh, I'll tell you now, I looked at the interaction between recruitment synchrony and access, uh, and it was not interesting. It was sort of exactly what you would expect, so I'm just going to present them independently. Um, so here in this figure, you see the mean total revenue. This is aggregated across all the vessels, across all the fisheries. What's the average revenue for all of the vessels um, for the 50 years? And then the variability, this will be a distribution, and the variability in the distribution is across these 10,000 simulations. Um, there's three distributions. One, the red one is for asynchronous recruitment. The yellow one is independent recruitment among the three populations. And the teal one is synchronous recruitment. And so what we see is the mean of the mean, the, this, the peak is in the same place, regardless of what's going on with recruitment. Um, but when recruitment when it's synchronous, we see more 50-year simulations where um, there was just a ton of money across all three um, fisheries and more 50-year simulations where there was very little money synchronously across all three fisheries. That's, there was uh, more variability across simulations um, with synchronous recruitment. There was also more variability within a simulation. So now you're looking at the coefficient of variation of revenue. So this is revenue variability for all of the revenue once again. So um, what, what this figure is showing is when <clears throat> recruitment is synchronous, um, you're more likely to see within a single simulation um, really bad years across all three fisheries and really good years across all three fisheries. Whereas when recruitment is asynchronous, all of the years are kind of similar. Let's dig in and look at where this change in revenue variability is coming from. So in this figure, these are the six um, permit combinations I looked at. So the top row are specialists that only fish for one fishery, participate in one fishery, and the bottom row um, participate in more than one fishery. Um, and now we're looking at um, variability of revenue for an individual participant, the average individual participating in this fishery. And again, the variability is across simulation. The specialists see no change in variability. This isn't terribly surprising. We're, so the, uh, this decrease in variability should be from a portfolio effect. They don't have a portfolio. They just start fishing for one population. They don't see a change. This is more surprising. If you hold a ground, crab ground fish portfolio, you also didn't care what the synchrony was between crab and ground fish. And what's going on here is that even though recruitment, so the early life history survival of crab and ground fish um, is similar because they have this similar physical environment that they're sharing, um, the actual biomass available to the fishery is not synchronous between crab and ground fish because crab are this boom and bust. Um, the biomass available is just whatever um, recruited that year, whereas with ground fish, there's all of this carryover from the previous year. Um, and so ground fish biomass is very constant across the years and is not synchronous with ground biomass. So all of that change in variability, um, that decrease in variability as you um, uh, makes recruitment more asynchronous was due to the crab-salmon combination. So these two boom best populations, when they're asynchronous, that's less variable, and when they're more synchronous, that's um, more variable. 
All right. Um, and then looking now at those same sort of the same metrics, but looking at fishery access. Um, so what I'm going to do, um, it, there's sort of, a, a, there's going to be different access scenarios. And what I'm basically doing is I'm putting either more, same number of vessels, but more of the vessels are specialists. Um, in the um, more challenging access, and when access is easy, more of the vessels um, have permits for multiple fisheries. This was a surprising result. I would expect um, if there's the same number of vessels and there's more permits available, there should be more fish getting caught, which means there should be more revenue. But that was not the case. So here you see when there's hard access in bluish teal, that's when we see the most revenue. And then what's going on um, is if you dig in, if you divide that revenue by species now, the result for groundfish and salmon was exactly what I expected. When there's more salmon permits, there's more salmon caught and there's more sac revenue. The, the whole result was driven by crab because there's a lot more revenue in the crab fishery in general, which is true on the West Coast. Um, and what's going on is, so the crab fishery is this, um, uh, derby fishery, everything's caught really quickly at the beginning of the season. There's a bunch of people participating. There's just so much crab caught early in the season that they flood the market. And they get really low prices for that crab. So even though more biomass is getting caught, they're not earning as much money for that biomass um, because the market is getting flooded and they're, they're getting low prices. So that's, that's what's causing that difference there. Um, I would also point out that individuals are experiencing some difference in the aggregate. So that was sort of what's going on for total revenue in the fishery, but now we're looking at how much individuals are earning in the fishery. And what we see is that um, for each possible permit portfolio, people earn less money for a given permit portfolio when access to, to permits is easier. And what's happening is we're basically, we have, we're Expanding the slice of, we're expanding, growing the pie a little bit. We are catching more fish, but we're also cutting the pie up of, into more pieces. And each person is getting a smaller slice of the pie. So there's more getting caught, more revenue earned, um, at least for salmon and ground fish. Um, but that pie is, each person gets a smaller piece of the pie, so each person gets less revenue. Um, uh, I think this is sort of just a couple more slides. Um, so this was sort of surprising as well. Access doesn't influence variability. Um, I would have, I sort of expected as you are able to have a more diverse fishing portfolio, you should have benefit from portfolio effects and see less variability. So we didn't see that at the aggregate level. Um, we also didn't see it at the individual level when we looked at each different possible fishing portfolio. But what's actually happening when we move among these access scenarios is we're moving people, we're moving vessels from this panel into, um, into these bottom panels. And so we don't actually see differences within a panel, we're just moving the number of vessels that are in each panel. So instead, if we look at, um, this is now individual variability aggregated across all of the possible permit portfolios, we do sort of see a, a result that we expect. This, um, hump right here is due to groundfish specialists. So these are people, um, groundfish is the least variable across years um, it's, uh, because it's so steady, uh, because it's this long lived population, um, a groundfish specialist sees very little variability. Um, and so when we increase permit access, we decrease the number of groundfish specialists, and decrease the size of this hump. Um, but if you ignore that one hump, the rest of the pattern sort of is as expected, and um, this distribution shifts left to less variability as we improve permit access. Uh, so what's a manager to do? Uh, so I think the conclusions for this, I sort of wanted to frame what a manager might want to do. So first, think carefully about what metrics to base your decisions on. We saw different results at the individual and aggregate level. Um, when you improve access, you also, um, you saw different results for variability um, and average revenue. You also um, see more, um, less inequality in the fleet when you improve access, so that might be something you care about. Second is there's this inherent trade-off between the average revenue that you earn from a permit portfolio and the variability of, of your revenue. And so that there's just this trade-off and we need to acknowledge that it's there and make a decision about um, sort of where we want to lie on, on that curve. 
if you are a manager and um, you your ecosystem is synchronous, I think the fishermen are going to rely on really long-lived populations for stability. I sort of think of the ground fish as like the bonds of fisheries. Um, and so providing access to those long-lived um, populations is important and um, also managing them carefully to keep the abundance as steady as you can. Um, if your populations are asynchronous, lucky for you. Um, so policies that permit portfolio diversification among any live history type then can benefit revenue. Um, and then just uh, before I wrap up, sort of some concluding thoughts. So as a quantitative ecologist, I, I work on a wide variety of things, but I think the consistent thread here is that single species management, um, management and science, looking at a single sector is not really sufficient. Um, so thinking um, about, to understand sort of the dynamics between rockfish and lingcod, it's important to think not just about the bycatch, but also about the trophic dynamics between them. Um, and catch shares, um, are a really good solution ecologically and economically from a single fishery perspective. But when you think at this larger scale and look across fisheries, um, it's a slightly different story. And so I think, and then the, this first example, I think it is sort of gives a possible path forward where we might think about ways to sort of simplify the system and look for, look at cases um, that, look at connections that might be most important. We can't think of everything at once. Um, but uh, oops, we can't think of all possible connections at once, but hopefully we can pick out the most important ones uh, in each case. So uh, thank you for uh, listening and tuning in today. Uh, and also a quick plug, I am looking for grad students for sort of this next fall, and I'll also probably be hiring a postdoc in the nearest future as well, if you are interested. And sorry, that went a bit long, but I am happy to take any questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, and first of all, welcome back to Hatfield in its way. Uh, I think we have a couple of REUs actually online today. So it's a yeah, really nice uh, circle uh, that's being completed at the moment. Um, if anybody has questions, feel free to type them into the chat box. Um, that way we can get those answered. And while we're kind of waiting for folks to catch up to us, um, I had a question a little bit. You alluded to the shift in the crab fishery season. Um, and I was wondering if your last model could kind of capture how that would impact revenue uh, when we start shifting seasons when you have uh, generalist fishers and how that impacts not only the ecology but also the revenue. You could speak yeah. to So I, for those who don't know, I guess, what I, the crab fishery has both been delayed um, due to whale entanglements and also demoic acid in like recent years and it's also getting closed much earlier also due to um, well, entanglements and because whale distributions, uh, whale distributions have been changing due to climate change, and so now there's more interactions between whale populations and the fishery. Um, I think you could capture it. I, I tried to look at it briefly, and the results were very boring. There was like no difference at all, um, which makes me think that there was sort of uh, something missing in the like an important process that wasn't that wasn't in the model. So when you're building any model, you sort of need to make simplifications of the real world. And so I think if because nothing was happening, I was very suspicious. So I, 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 I am actually interested in sort of digging in more and figuring out what process was missing because it definitely is like fishermen will tell you it's changing things. Um, and so I'd be interested, I'm sort of interested uh, in sort of um, potentially figuring out using this model to ask some of those questions, but it isn't capable of doing that just yet. Yeah, I think forecasting a little bit of that would be a, a high value to some folks, yeah. uh, not only for the fishers, but also the managers that are trying to figure out how to adjust to that kind of change. Yeah. Um, it doesn't look like we have any questions coming in quite yet. So um, I'll take us on a slightly different direction. Can you talk to those folks that um, are our students online and just talk a little bit about how your journey has taken you to where you're at, to where you're inviting students to work with you? Yeah. Um, I think, it, so I think I took a rather uh, sideways path to academia. Um, I was really open when I was like, so I took a year off after, after undergrad, um, wasn't really doing a lot of science. I was always really interested in sort of using quantitative tools to understand um, like applied ecology and marine science. Um, and it, I had, a, I think it is hard to get jobs doing that with just a bachelor's degree. There's a lot of field technicians and lab positions, but I didn't really have the background for those positions. I also 
somewhat similar to these students graduated into a recession, which made things challenging. Um, so uh, yeah, grad school was a great insulator from a recession for me. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so I think I was always sort of interested in that. And that's sort of why I ended up going to grad school is I was having trouble finding jobs that sort of allowed me to do what I wanted. Um, I was really interested in both academic and agency jobs. And I'm, um, you know, looked at jobs at NOAA as well. I think I, what I like about being a professor, or I'm very new to it, but what I think I will like about being a professor, is sort of the opportunity, not just but also a lot of teaching and mentoring and sort of have these like three problems to my job, um, rather than focusing more exclusively on the science. Nice. Thank you so much. Um, so if anybody has questions, I think I'm going to encourage folks to reach directly out. Um, your uh, contact information is on the screen, so you're uh, welcome to do that. And if you have any questions about um, opportunities or positions, you can reach out to Dr. Oken as well. So for everybody online, we're getting a couple. Uh, thank you very much coming in um, on the chat box. So uh, don't feel like people aren't integrating and, and talking to you. Um, yep, thank you very, very much. So for those of you online, I um, hope to see you again next week. Um, and for our speaker today, thank you so much for taking the time and joining the Hatfield community once again. Uh, we sure appreciate it. Oh yeah, look at that. They're all coming in now. They all say thank you, thank you, thank you. So that's great. Um, appreciate it, everybody. Uh, we'll talk to you next week and thank you so much. Uh, we'll talk to you all soon. Thanks everyone. Bye, Bye now.